I'll open with this. I usually don't do monologues. Monologues would be the word, but uh, I do wanted to. Say, I do want to say uh, talk about Raheem just because I know he's interviewing for just about every head coaching job in the NFL right now, and it's been three years. But what I do, I haven't had a lot of opportunities to talk about him. Number one, I think we all know, great human being. Uh, the guy's coded to let's call it respect everyone to build a relationship with everyone, no matter where you're at in the organization. And what's awesome is, is as he does that, you just see the respect flow back in his direction. And that's just, that's just, he's coded for that. He's, it's a, it's a superpower that I think would help any organization. He's highly intelligent human being who happened to choose football and probably could have done a lot of things in life, but I chose the path of football, uh, I remember when he came here to be our defensive coordinator, uh, having a relationship with Rich McKay in Atlanta. And Rich said, wow, what a unique uh, experience and let's call it unique football acumen that he had based on he's coached in a defensive room. He's actually coached in an offensive room. And whether he was a mentee learning, whether he was partnering with people, whether he was mentoring and leading others, you know, those great Tampa defenses, that great uh, Atlanta offense that nearly pulled off a Super Bowl win. I mean, he was in the offensive room. He was in those defensive rooms. So there, there's not many coaches uh, on the planet, right, who's been in both of those rooms on those two sides of the ball. He's going to he's going to build a he's going to give any organization an edge and just how collaborative he is. It's going to be it's going to be an edge that uh, most teams aren't going to be able to compete with. I know this, he'll be able to hire an unbelievable staff. Every coach who's any good, who's qualified, who wants, they're going to want to work for Raheem. And I'm pretty sure there'll be a lot of tampering charges because just about every player in the NFL is going to text him and want to come play for him. I'll let the NFL handle that. But I, I haven't had a lot of chance, uh, a chance to, to sit down and, and let people know what I really think uh, of that human being. What he did for us during the Super Bowl run, calling the defense in some of those games, that speaks for itself. I do think if you're looking for a coach this year, what he did with our defense uh, and how they evolved and how even when they were taken on water in some games during uh, first halves, the adjustments that were made at halftime and just also just psychologically calming everyone down. That, okay. It's going to be all right. And, and we played some unbelievable second halves with, I mean, the, I'm sure we'll talk about it today, right? The how that defense was built and and the let's call it the less than experience that they had. But that's uh want to talk about Rob before we get started on uh maybe the 2023 season. Awesome. Awesome. Start with you, Stu. Thanks, Les. First of all, well said uh on Raheem and appreciate uh you sharing those thoughts on him. Um Speaking of the defense, um, you know, what were your thoughts on not only the rookies and, you know, how they performed on that side of the ball, but also just, you know, that class as a whole, as far as the production you were able to get out of that 2023 group? You know, I think uh, anytime we talk about the 23 group, uh, because it was recent, because it was new, I think what they did as rookies speaks for themselves. The, the, the way they were just able to hang in there, it's it's an eight, you know, 18 week plus season i remember talking to a few of them i mean college football ended a long time ago if you weren't necessarily you know gonna and you had a week off even if you were in the final four and those guys were like wow we're just about halfway through our season so that, that speaks for themselves and, and they've been unbelievable i do think i do think there was a lot of players also that were here before uh not necessarily n new toys uh, a lot of the secondary a few defensive linemen you know Ernest, the linebackers that, that also played a part in in that defense evolving collectively from from start to finish to to on paper being okay. This is this is not a lot of experience. How good can we actually get to, uh, and how fast can we get there? And and I think we uh, I would say this. There's many times during the year I mentioned the show on Anna Raw that wow. We've gotten there a lot faster and probably a little bit farther than I thought we could. And just as a follow up to that, how, if at all, does that change the way you view you view 
um, how you guys are going to build this roster in, in 2024 and what the team's needs might potentially be based on what you expected or didn't expect, you know, to get out of uh, that rookie group in particular. I think it, I think a lot of let's call it the blueprint for 2024 moving forward, and then for the years beyond that, we'll we'll take an intentional approach to that. And right now, it's probably decompress. And then it then it'll be come back, and we'll be intentional in how we meet. They'll, they'll right when we get back post Super Bowl, we'll probably review. Let's call it we call it an end of season review. Where okay, who are we? Where are we at? What progress was made? All those things. And then there's going to be there's going to be an intentionality of of coming back and reviewing that when the coaches get in. And as the coaches get in, and I always call it cut up phase, and and they'll watch a lot of cut ups. And it's really not necessarily to eval players, or it's really how do how do they, how are they sharpening their schemes? What was good? What wasn't so good? What can we things like that? But as you go through that, and there's a lot less emotion in terms of a result, in terms of how many points do we have at the end of the game, and how many points does the opponent have? In those in those settings, it's really trying to sharpen our saw. And 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 sometimes there's some moments where you go, wow. This kid came in and he was a little less experienced, but he played good good minutes for us. Maybe we can count on that player a little bit more, and and I think we've always done that. I think we'll we'll continue doing that. But the the blueprint for 2024 and beyond, we'll begin working on it. What you were mentioning, Stu, I think uh, we're fortunate to have uh, another year of multiple probably more than the normal seven draft picks we have the first round pick this year so we'll definitely continue trying to add uh quality football players uh from that portion of the acquisition uh calendar the draft and then and then again bring them in blend them with the group we have and and hopefully uh be better than we were this year at least in terms of manpower and then from there we we'll try to continue evolving the comp the collective to become as competent as possible. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, hey, Les, um, speaking of that number one or that first round pick, do you anticipate that you will use that pick to actually select a player or more follow form and, and trade back for more picks? I think a, a little too early to tell. That's probably cliche, Gary. I think, but I think what we'll do, Gary, is – Obviously, you always have to prepare to pick. What if no? What if you wanted to trade up or back? No one wants to uh, dance with you. You know, you, we're not going to Minnesota Viking this thing. I think and and just pass. I, I, but don't want to get on them. But so you always have to be able to prepare to pick. And then at that point in time, probably depending on uh, what player is there or not, do we determine is it better to move back and acquire more picks. So I think all of those options are going to be on the table. It's early, but uh, uh, I think we'll begin pretty quickly when we get back uh, mm -hmm. really assessing the players who have a, let's call it a legitimate chance of being in and around 19. And then there's going to be some players that we're also going to have to be disciplined to pass on, right? First round talent, but maybe not quite a scheme fit for whatever reason. So you got to be able to prepare to pick prepare to pass on some players and and see if a, a trade back or trade up is uh, beneficial for the Rams. Um, what is Stetson Bennett's status? And do you anticipate he will be with the Rams next season? I think we'll, again, when we get back and start assessing the 2024 season, we'll definitely uh, Stetson will be a part of that mix in terms of uh, next steps with him uh, doing well, look forward to, uh, revisiting with him and, and seeing where that goes. Uh, there's one thing, I mean, there's this one thing that probably Sean and myself do really, really bad is we never prepare uh, for the abrupt ending of a season. So <laughs> it's like, there's no calendar made or really not a lot of discussion about future. Cause we're, we're always preparing and expecting to, to win the next game in advance. And we can talk about the off season later would you describe that you know decision to draft him as a mistake and no, it, i would say no because it's it's very early uh in the down 
You see what I mean? I think so. Do you determine whether a draft pick is a mistake? You, you probably got to get to the totality of of the career. Mm -hmm. And so time will tell. Um, in you, can't, you can't microwave life, as I always say. Uh, in terms of Aaron, Matthew, and Cooper, do you expect all three of them to be back next season? You know what? I, at this point, I would say yes, and and I'm, uh, I and we, I would say this: we would want every one of them back. Let's just be clear on that. Mm -hmm. uh, haven't I haven't sat down and chatted with any of those, but at this point in time, doesn't seem like, uh, uh, you know that that they are are wanting to move on, but time will tell on that. F finally, for me, um, you know, typically you at least in the last since you guys have been out here in LA, it doesn't seem like you've invested very heavily in terms of re-signing middle you know, inside linebackers. Um, with Ernest Jones, will he change that? I mean, will you guys extend him before next season? I think he's obviously he's someone who is a very important part of that defense for many reasons. Definitely the leader of the defense, uh, or has evolved to become one of the one of the the key leaders of the defense. So and and then I think in that Gary too, it's in the past there's been I mean, obviously we've been invested in some other positions, mm -hmm. but I think he, as I think as we evolve and, and as teams evolve, there's times where. Right, you may be uh, less invested at a certain position that you were in the past, and and one of your better players is an inside linebacker. So uh, he's definitely someone we'll discuss, and definitely someone we we'd like to have around. Thanks very much, Adam. Hey, Les. Um, a lot of veterans and coaches on this team have talked about you know, what a special group it was just in terms of locker room dynamic as the person who put together this team on paper, like what is, was it like to see them kind of come together as a unit? Yeah, it, it's, I think Sean and I've talked a lot about it based on right where we've been. And, and I've been fortunate, right. I, I don't, I can't even tell you how many years I've been fortunate to be a general manager in this league, but I do know it's, maybe 12, 13, 11. But uh, with that being said, very fortunate to right kind of have built, broken through and actually right uh, hike to the mountaintop uh, once per se or, or got closed twice. Now, with that being said, we're fortunate in, wow, there's, there's ebbs and flows and timelines in NFL where I'm sure a lot of coaches – you know, when they, I always think about the Pittsburgh Steelers, where I'm sure someone like Bill Cowher, who coached so long, Chuck Noll, that you go through these where you build these teams, and then that team probably uh, expires a little bit and you have to start over. Uh, so the longevity, being fortunate to have longevity in this job, there's that moment like here we are. And I think what, what you were trying to ask and what this team did is it brought you back to, as Sean talked about the joy of why you do it. And there's this element where you see this group uh, of men in our building, women, uh, not just the players, but everyone who's a part of it. And everyone, no matter where they're at on the hierarchy or what job they have or what role they have. I mean, there's, there's this one common goal to somehow collectively come together and thrive and it's really really neat when you get to you get to experience it and it's a lot of work from let's call it the end of last year through the draft OTAs training camp the season and see everyone just come in each and every day and in that day right try to do something that day to to inch us forward and then you see how the dividends compound and 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 in football, in the NFL, the element of reward is often a result where you have more points than someone else on the scoreboard at the end, and that's the fulfillment. And there's, it's fascinating when you get on a team playing, coming home or our locker room after a win, you can say, okay, that there's something different uh, about winning 
it, there's a feeling there that so to see to see so long story short to see this young group of people i said this i'll say it like this reggie and i talked about it the longer you're in this sometimes you have adult problems right you're there's this element where right do you know you have kids and teen, they're going through things to see not only just players but young people in this building start their careers and actually just go, I dreamed of playing in the NFL and I dreamed of being a part of a winning team in the NFL and here we are doing it. There's that element that's contagious. Like, okay, you know, I remember when that was a dream. So that that's, it was cool for us who sometimes the adult problems will kind of outweigh that fundamental joy, just playing football at this level that a lot of people dream of. When you hear veterans and coaches talk about, you know, the special chemistry of this group, how much does that come into consideration when you have a team captain like Jordan Fuller, who's a free agent? I think you, 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 we definitely have to talk about that because uh, anytime a leader goes out, uh, it's probably hard to replace that exact leader. And at that point in time, it's very important to identify, okay, what, as a person, as a leader, what 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 leadership tools that someone providing it? If that person's walking out of the building for whatever reason, whether it's wit retiring, whether it's we paid some players can't pay uh, another player, and they and they get an opportunity somewhere else, it's you're always you, we definitely it's one where you need to discuss what left the building, take skill set out of it. But in terms of leadership, is there a, do we have someone from within that can fill it? And at the end of the day, even if that person can fulfill it, that person has the potential to fulfill it. I think the chemistry part goes, it's not like someone can walk out of the building and that person raise his hand and say, OK, I'm the, I'm the next man up. I'm the next leader. Right. That particular person has to right come in earn equity, uh, all of those things get to know, blend, and that chemistry begins, right? Whatever experiment you have, it begins gelling. So uh, that's the tough part about this business is, is there's there's times when you actually uh, lose useful skill when players move on. But the very, very hard part is to lose that leadership quality that definitely is an important part of blending the energy that you have for that particular team in that moment. On Wednesday, Sean talked about how, you know, this team kind of felt similar to how it did at the end of 2017 going into 2018 um, in terms of a young team that was kind of on the rise at the end of the year. Do you, you know, obviously that, off season between 2017 and 2018 that this franchise took a lot of big swings. Um, what did you learn from that off season and how much does it inform you going into this off season? I think the, I think what you, you, whether it was that season, this season, I always said that there's times where you probably use the, the moment or the current season as an element. I, I always call it a model of, of, who you are and sometimes you need that right to to figure out what 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 piece we may add or not add things like that so you you need that moment to go okay this is who we are uh, at this particular moment and then doesn't mean we're going to be that again next year but there is a, a belief that we can continue from this. And, and from there, you use that model to go, okay, what, what skill is useful for what skill gives us an edge that this team might not have. And then, and then like you said too, there's going to be moments where we're going to lose some skill and edges from this team. Unfortunate, you know, no team's the same year in and year out. And you go, okay, we, we're going to lose that maybe, or we're not even sure when we're going to lose it. And then at that point, you figure out how do we replace that? So I, I I think what you learn is, is you basically in this league have to evolve of who you are. And at that point, you have to continue off of that model 
going, who do you want to be based on who we are today and, and how can we get there? Thank you. Sarah. Hey, happy birthday. Um, I think this is the second year in a row artists have scheduled it on today. So I don't really? know. If he, yeah. I don't know if he has that marked on his calendar on purpose, but. Um, Historically, I can tell you my birthdays have been bad because they're in and around divisional in the past, maybe conference championship games. And obviously the math says, <laughs> unfortunately in the NFL, you're not consistently playing really deep into the playoffs. So over the years of being in an NFL, man, birthdays have stunk. Um, okay. Well, then I will stop talking about your birthday. I still um, talk about a birthday. We were the number one seed in Atlanta. And Aaron Rodgers comes to town. And I, I don't even remember the game. It, it was like our London game a few years back with New England. I think we might have gone up 7 nothing, And I think I was telling artists the other day. And it was like all of a sudden it was 7 all, 14-7, 21-7, 28-7. Tw I don't even know how many points they score. Time ran out on them. But I'm sure they were right down there about to score again. Hate that you brought it up. Sarah. Yeah, sorry, sorry to bring that up. Um, Happy so birthday. <laughs> Raheem, um, I was asking Raheem about um, maybe the, the patience that Sean had developed in the last year. Um and he said one area he saw the patients was in the draft process. He said they had a lot more conversations and it seemed like not that you guys spent more time on it, but just, I guess there were more conversations about it. Did you see that? And how did you see last year's draft process or involve um, Sean last year? I, you know, I, I can say that Sean's always been, you know, let's call it very involved. I mean, I'd go back to our first draft. I mean, he was a, a fan of what Gerald ever brought to us. He was a fan of what Cooper Cup could bring to all, all of those things. And, and I don't want to say a fan. He had done a lot of work and does a nice job of articulating a vision. If anything was different about last year's draft than most is, is a lot of our other drafts, we had, it's called, we had a, a veteran team. We had a lot of core players that were, experience and on paper right barring injury they were pretty much going to come in and earn a starting job and a lot of our our drafts have been you're, you're drafting players who are going to be you know it's called robins to batman they're going to play roles they're going to uh they're going to help along the way and some of them right even started along the way they just probably get drowned based on some of the let's call it higher profile players that we had. Uh, so with that being said, I think the one thing that was different about this draft is we were very aware well along the way that a lot of these players, right. And in particular on the, on the defensive side of the ball. And there's a few like with the, with draft and Steve on the well, there's when we make this pick, right. We're this player is not expected to come in and, and let's call it play a role, but has a, good chance of of starting if that player shows that he can handle that responsibility so uh but i think that would be the the difference but i can say that in every draft there's a lot of work from scouts to coaches from start to finish <laughs> the amount of time trying to right stack a board pod players you know figure out which one's going to be better for us when that's very hard to do when you, you, you know, a lot of times you're talking about three good players that are going to be good. So. Uh, and, and then last year at this time, I don't know if Sean's ever going to be patient though. Like, you know I mean? That's nothing against Sean, but as I said, coded, what I mentioned about Rob being coded, you know, to respect others. I mean, Sean's coded to attack. So patience Um, and then last year you were at this press conference, you were talking about what word you would use to describe this off season, joked about rebuilding, reloading. Um, but when you look back, oh, at let's take a vote. What should we have in hindsight? What should we have named this off season? I don't know. Um, Come on, you're up. It looked like reloading, right? Um, but what did you learn from the mindset you had last off season with maybe less money to work with? Um, and how you built this team that you will take forward. 
Uh, I think that the, I mean, what you learned is, is we were intentional about what we were trying to do. Uh, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I think I'll, I could sum it up by saying this. You have to come in every day, whatever decisions you have or, or what phase you're in, whether it's preparing for the draft, whether it's, whether it's in the case of last year, monitoring what players out there are still available who we could get at a value based on all we had done that we still felt could help. And, and that goes on through May, July, August. Point being is when you do something like we did, it, you have to basically come in every single day and try to do your best. That's cliche. Uh, make sound and just know that the philosophy is going to be, we're going to come in and every day we're going to try to get an edge somehow. And we're going to then we're well aware if we do that, there's going to be some dividends that compound. And hopefully when we get to a game, uh, we're going to prepare to play quality football. And then from there, you continue preparing to play quality football. And sometimes you play quality football and you have less points than the other team, but you got to somehow get through it and say, you know what, let's continue coming in try to do something today, everyone to build and play quality football. And and at the end of the, the year, it adds up to, oh, wow, we have 10 wins and seven losses. Uh, and I think I, my wife and I, Kara, were talking the other night how the NFL season will sometimes teach you that, and I get it, the season kicks off and, right, you get into who's 0-2 and, and all the stats go up of 0-2 teams making the play, whatever. But how – it does seem like when you get to week 18 in the season, like the first two weeks, really, no one can even name the 0 and 2 teams, right? But I think that's what you definitely uh, learn or take a lesson from. Thank you. Maria? Good morning, Les. I think last year you mentioned it was a remodel instead of a rebuild. When you talk about this past season at the team moving along a little faster than you thought. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah. I think the, the reason I said remodel is right. We did have some, uh, if you want to call it, we, I called them weight bearing walls, whether it's Matthew Stafford. I mean, the, when you have a quarterback that can play like him, whether you have Aaron Donald, Cooper, I mean, there and take those three, those always got talked about. Right. But I mean, Holy cow. I mean, you, I mean, you got to, I mean, Big Rig Higgs has got to go in there. I mean, Rob Havenstein, I mean, even Cole Michelle. There's there's so many players that, right, have put a lot of minutes in here. So there was this thought that we bring in some young players, let them partner with this group. There is a chance that we're, we're we could be competitive in, right? And, and I'll go back to this. If you're ever around Sean McVay, and I I know last year, it seems like Sean took a nap. And, you know, it, that he was refreshed after the nap. A lot of narrative, is he going to come back or not? He might have taken a 10-minute nap. And at that point in time, if you know Sean, every meeting after that wasn't about, I'm refreshed, maybe I'll coach, maybe I won't. It was – this is how we're going to play quality football next year. And it's right. This is how we're going to do it. And, and, and it, that's inspiring. That's why he's a contagious leader, but there's an interesting thing about it is there wasn't a necessarily with, with sitting with Sean and it's not like, the, let's just go do this. It's like, this is how we're going to do it. And we're going to take it day by day. So I think, you know, in that, in that element. Now I forgot what question you asked, but <laughs> about I, the team moving along at a faster pace than Yeah. You. So what I can say is this. I'm not surprised we had success this year, personally. In sitting just sitting down with Sean this time last year, after that nap, and he's refreshed and he's ready to go. And I know there was more to it than that. And he did some intentional things that he wanted to do so that right, he attacked 
not burning out, right? That's something he wanted to do intentionally. Like this is a, this is a hard, hard business. There's a lot of stress and drudgery in trying to be great. Uh, how do you intentionally get through that? But so the, the non-surprise part would be somewhere along the way we, we came in every day, uh, tried to figure out a way to get an edge so that we could play quality football. And then, then after OT, after you draft and you get all those players or you get, you get through OTAs and there's that moment of, okay, wait a minute. Matthew's healthy. Uh, Hooper's not healthy at that time, but wow. Puka Puka's emerging as someone that the offense can try. And then, then you do the whole, the same thing in camp. And then, and then there's you go to Seattle and there's this we're expecting to play quality football and have a rough first half, but come back second. So all of that through it all, you're evolving. But there was this belief that, OK, as long as we try to play quality football and even at, at three and six and knowing that we, you know, we went into the the Green Bay game a little left handed, you know, playing with the uh, backup QB, there was this belief that, OK, uh, we can take a break here and continue coming to try to play quality football. And so with that being said, not surprised that it occurred, but I'm well aware that uh, uh, I'm well aware of the journey that it, that it took and how disciplined it took to kind of take a, a one day at a time uh, approach. I know it's really early, but would you think it's important for Carson Wentz to stay with the Rams? I think I, I what I do know is this is, Really appreciated Carson. What a competitor, man! What a game that was last year. So he's someone that uh, came in and did a heck of a job in that Sam. That was a fun game to watch. Fun to see him compete. And and like everyone, like all the decisions we got to make, we'll definitely get to Carson and back up QB. But I do think it, it's important, uh, as we saw in Green Bay, is hey, if we can have a a backup quarterback that can help us win a game that right. Cause you know, losing the, the green Bay game could have, could have hurt us in the math, even though we, we had a very good second half of the season. And the only team we lost to was overtime to Baltimore that speaks for itself. But when you, when you do put yourself in a position where you may be left-handed because of your back, you're going to be left-handed probably because of your backup, but, uh, you see what I'm trying to say in the analogy, give you a chance to, to win those games. It, it definitely can help you when it's all said and done from a math perspective. Thanks Les. I hope you have a happy birthday. Thank you. George. Hey Les, good morning. Good morning. Um, There's a small sample size, but there is a sample size of uh, teams that have done a little bit similar of a like a sprint rebuild that you guys went went about this last season. Um, Seattle being, I think, one of the more recent examples. Um, so I guess I wonder for you guys, how do you avoid um, regression after a year which you're more successful than maybe some expected going in? You had uh, outstanding health for the most part um, to the quarterback, and uh, the development process seemed to be in an upward trajectory. What do you guys have to do as decision makers, but also you know as, as team builders and, and developers to avoid uh, regressing in twenty twenty four? Great question. Easier said than done because, uh, right the. From this point forward, it'll a lot of be a lot of messaging will be okay. You got to this point, and you'll just move forward next year. So, I, what we do know is is we can uh, reason that next year is going to be different. We'll be a different team. We're not just going to be able to show up and right hop back on the train and be in rhythm. That that took a lot of work, and and I think the thing that we can do is is what you can apply from this year is uh, because last year we really said, let's come in every day and let's try to do something every day so that the collective can play quality football. We never talked about having more points than another team. It's just quality football. And the more you can play quality football, the more chance you have to win. So the, the lesson would be 
not come in and think, okay, this is what we do and we'll now have 11 wins than, than 10. Uh, again, but that's a lot, that's easier said than done, Jordan, for sure. Uh, based on human nature, all of those things. But uh, I do think, uh, you know, getting back to the fundamentals of going, okay, it's, it's day one, everyone's refreshed, a little bit bored and, Let's start the, I always say the, the bittersweet part is I always say when the season ends, you get that ball as high up the boulder, as high up the mountain as you can, then it just rolls back down. I mean, holy cow, in Detroit the other night, that it took a lot of work to get that boulder to at Detroit. But when the clock hit zero, that thing went all the way back to the bottom. So we're not even, you know, we hadn't even started pushing it up again. We're trying to just get over that bowl rolling over us as it went back to the bottom. And, but I think that I always have that in my office because that's, it's going to really be each step of the way. Uh, and that's probably why cliches are cliches. There's some principles there that are truths. Living them is the hard part. Executing them is the hard part but will be the intention. Keep reminding us of that, Jordan. And the other thing I want to ask Jordan is how, is it because I mentioned remodel that now it can't be a remodel? Like it's got to be a sprint rebuild. It's kind like, of cool. It's kind you of know cool. what I mean? Is it only because I mentioned remodel that no one's going to go with this call it a remodel? People, I think taking you, it personal. You were looking for the, you were looking for the, uh, the alliteration assist there, but we're the writers, so we weren't going to give it to you. <laughs> yeah, it's just something about the relationship, you know. You just, you know, I understand. I understand. I should have, I should have called it a rebuild. Y'all would have come up with remodel. <laughs> It'd been like you can't be rebuilding. You have Matthew Staff. Okay, that's. Um, thank you. George. Speaking of moving large items, um, how did you guys go about restructuring your? Offensive line, um, the talent identification philosophy matching with the scheme shift. And do you see continuity there? I'm talking specifically about, you know, guys like Kevin Coleman. Um, do you see continuity there moving forward into this offseason? I would say that's definitely the vision. And I and if let's just say that doesn't come to fruition, uh, I think it's something we definitely have to make sure we continue addressing because uh, running the football, protecting the QB, uh, you, we saw this year how it can help you, especially on the offensive side of the ball. So, uh, right, give give Ryan, his, you know, Sean Ryan, assistant OL coaches credit. They they came in and with what we had and, and continue developing them. We made a couple of moves that uh, ended up helping us along the way. So, that would be the vision. Uh, continuity on the offensive line is very important, and and whatever happens, we have to make sure we we have quality offensive linemen here that can help us do what we need to do. Understanding that Kevin, specifically with how he came in and, and finished this year of his career, um, may figure to have a competitive conversation in terms of a, a contract extension. Is that something you guys? start now is that something that that you guys are are committed to um i guess being competitive in where it comes to him but yeah what i do i would i would bet with you jordan that uh he'll definitely have a a marketplace for sure people are going to want him to come play football for them we're one of those teams and like i mentioned a little bit earlier the way we try to do it here and boy do i feel right for some of our players right because your your contract's expiring and there's uncertainty of the future and and it, it where am I going to be what's my new salary going to be all of those things and and they're man it's a blessing especially when you play good football and you have a chance to we'll take it a little bit slower we'll again go decompress come back and uh, again assessing who we are where we want to go into 24, also into the future, how that puzzle right works out. And and like you mentioned, there's 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 going to be times where right a player may may be able to make 
more money than even we're willing to or can somewhere else. And, and you have to, you have to go through those discussions and those are, that's the, I guess you'd call it the the hard part of the business because there's human beings involved and there is angst and anxiety. There's discussions along the way. Uh, sometimes it's probably somewhat exciting to from your end, right. To cover and, you know, people are moving zip codes and things like that and the off season and all of that. So, but we'll take, we'll be very intentional about it. That's why it would probably be common sense, right? Even even when you ask uh, about a player that you probably know the answer. Like, I bet the Rams would like to have that player back, uh, Kevin being one of them, not the only one. But we have to, we're definitely going to have to be intentional and, and go through this process. But I can say, too, just, I mean, agents will call, we'll start – We'll start, you know, let's call it engineering, designing, kind of a blueprint, more importantly, a timeline of communication so that each step of the way they they know where we stand. That way they, uh, you know, they can react, proact off of that. Thank you, Les. Shout out to Sisyphus. I can never pronounce that. Thanks for doing that, Jordan. Beach. The Sisyphean statue you got right there, Les. Uh, hey, your kicking game struggled this year as much as anybody has in recent years. Uh, did did this experience change your philosophy at all on on how you spend money on the kicking game and how you how you allocate those that those resources? At this point in time, all it's done is uh, basically reinforced that I have no clue as a general manager about kicking, which I probably knew that. This season just reinforced that. Now, with that being said, I don't, and I say that tongue in cheek. There's there's human beings involved, and, and they miss kicks. But I I do think also the the operation being new, it, especially when we we lost uh, long snapper and, and new long snapper comes in, and Ethan's never held before, and he was getting better. To, so there's a lot going on with the kicking situation because I don't I again the kicker is gonna gonna get the the blame a lot of times for and, and, and in our situation, there were times where it's kicker's fault. There was times where maybe it was a snap fault, a little bit of a hold. All those guys were evolving. So there's a tongue in cheek there, but it, I definitely, I definitely think uh, I can answer this uh, improving. Our, let's call it extra point field goal. Making consistency is definitely a priority or improving our go for it on fourth down. Once we cross, it's definitely going to be a priority. But, but again, I think that it was unfortunate, and it got pretty tough. Hadn't been through that before, you know, as a general manager and even as a being in personnel. Have gone through those moments where, okay, you got a young kicker with talent, and there's some inconsistencies, and you get it back on the rails a little bit. Uh, gone through mid-season changes and, and and gotten a veteran in and kind of gotten back on the rails. So it, it was interesting to go through. Uh, but everybody was trying. Uh, everybody cared. And uh, But definitely was an issue that we have to address. Sean indicated something like that, too, that it wasn't always the kicker's fault. That sometimes there are other factors going on besides the kicker. Does that make you, you know, the, the logical solution to that is to have a backup quarterback who's who's an OG who knows how to hold and has done it for a long time. Does, does, did that uh, did that occur to you guys at all that that, that was probably a, a way to go? Well, the, the, that was the old-fashioned way of doing it. Talking through with Chase and the special teams experts, the good thing about having punters do it is they – because if you the the backup QB is usually going to be practicing on another field, right? Scout team during the season. So the punter can usually just, I mean, you could get 200, 300 holds a day, like just holds. You're not going to kick the ball 300 times and wear the kicker out. So that would, that's the ideal thing. And we, and we knew when we took a, when we drafted Ethan, I mean, Compliment to him was he was punter and kicker at Wingate, so he didn't hold. Uh, the neat thing for us, it, it allowed – I mean, what he did for us kicking off, because he had that kicking background, uh, was a weapon for us. And punting 
right? He's definitely got a chance to be a very good punter based on uh, mom, dad, God given talent and figures. Now, there's a subset of he can continue evolving as a holder. And even in the uh even in the the Detroit game, I mean he did he might have had his best hold of the year. Snap was inside on I I don't know if it was a Brett field goal or extra point. I don't know if you saw it, but he did a heck of a job holding. So that would be the reason to continue evolving right with the punter being the holder. Now because we're having trouble we we did discuss should we go to a backup holder, but again, uh, we got used to our group, and then we had to bring in a new long snapper. So it just it just it just you know I, I th- you know for that young group I give them credit I give credit for Brett coming in. Uh, I remember Brett saying, uh, you know what, I'm the veteran. My job's to make the kick, and 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 that was a a pretty cool attitude where some kickers would go, it's got to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, I might not make the kick. So, And then you spend most of the last off, just for another subject, you spend most of the last off season with a pretty young secondary on your roster. But then in the season, you ended up relying pretty heavily on two veterans who were on the street in late June. What can you say about the job Akello and, and JJ did? And uh, how did that affect, you know, how, what what did that what did that show you as a GM? What did that teach you? That that kind of thing. Well, I think we it was our first experience with Akello, but obviously we had played against him and and we were well aware probably we were we were thin at corner, not just in experience, but probably in numbers. And historically, especially with us, you know, there's times where corners are gonna go down and miss a few because we always knew a veteran would definitely come in and and help us get through the year. And, and the neat thing is he came in and actually uh, became one of a, a very consistent performer and made plays for us down the stretch. And and then I, we always, you know, we've always respected JJ. So him coming back, getting in the mix, you know, let's call it reemerging himself in our defense. I think what you did feel when, when JJ did get in is he's probably elite at, at uh, communicating and elite at, getting that secondary as a collective to be competent in terms of this is what to expect. And, and, a, and a lot, a lot of veteran safeties, right. That's their, that can be their superpower. That can be the edge they give a team uh, because they've seen a lot. They've maybe sparred with, with uh, specific offensive coordinators, all of those things, all of those reps over the years uh, and that pattern recognition. So uh, didn't surprise us. Uh, neat thing is it took him a little bit to get reintegrated and, and our young players were playing sound football. But uh, and I think the, the the thing I would say is if you – lessons learned is when you do have a, a young group, I do think the right veterans coming in and blending with them, it, it's – that mixture – that mixture is – it's got to be net positive. There's times where you go all young – uh, but at, at that moment, right. I, you know, there's, there, you don't have, other than the coach or voice in the room, you don't have that veteran to be able to, let's call it steady the waters when, when the boat's taking on a little water, like, okay, Hey, it's whether it's between series is at halftime, things like that, uh, that young players don't have. So I, I definitely think it's net positive when you can right, add the right vets in and, they can complement each other. Thanks, Oscar. Uh Gary just had one more one more quick one. Um, Gary, you're finally gonna announce this as a remodel. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, after I'm just curious, after last season's or this past season's, you know, kind of spending pullback, you've got 40 million plus uh cap space. And so I'm just wondering what, what's it like for you personally as a GM to be able to have, you know, that kind of uh, cash available and, and, you know, do you get excited about being able to actually spend money this year. Well, I think it, again, going back, I think someone asked earlier, right. Similar to probably after, after the 17 season, what it does give you a healthy, healthy way to evolve as a team. Uh, 
and continue to add pieces. I probably would not expect us to go out on, you know, the bell rings opening new year and, and spend 40 million, uh, let's call it in free agency. Uh, but I, what, what it does allow us to do is, is take a look in free agency in the past, sometimes in free agency, because we, again, we had locked in salary cap resources to players that were coming back. And there was that, the whole comp formula where we knew we were going to lose do, these two veterans because we just couldn't pay them. And we restrained from adding UFAs and it gets technical, right? Knowing we're going to get comp picks or so we're going to get extra draft picks. That's very beneficial. And we didn't mean we didn't sign veterans. Sometimes it would be cap casualties, guys that got cut so they don't affect the comp formula. So this is going to be very different, Gary. And okay, wait a minute. Uh, I always go back to probably the COVID cap would be one reason why we probably, again, it was a choice by us. We always say we choose other people. It was probably one of the reasons we couldn't re-sign John Z Johnson then is it was the first time the cap went backwards instead of forwards. And we had done what we had done. And John was able to write, uh, get a better contract from Cleveland. In, in this case, this year, it's like, okay, we do, have the ability to re-sign within. You mentioned like Ernest, right? He, he's not a unrestricted. Mm -hmm. He's just finishing his third year. So do you, do you, re in the past, it's been tough for us to re-sign someone, okay. you know, after three years. So that's, and then it's also going to give you the element to, okay, is there, is, is there a possible unrestricted free agent that we haven't really been able to acquire in the past? Maybe, again, probably because we did it in, in trades and things like that, that's a possibility. And then it also allows you to, if you do make trades for veterans, you can take on, you know, their salary. So it, it gives you flexibility. I don't think, you know, we're sitting here today going, okay, let's, let's spend all 40 million right within the first hour. And I don't think you were alluding to that at all, Gary, but, but you understand what I was trying to say. 